into another pregame aftershock. I'm super excited to have on one of my ASA Slack buddies, uh, Kieran Doyle. Kieran, how's everything going? Things are terrific in the Great White North. It's the first week we've been able to get outside and play soccer. So I am chuffed right now. So I have I have someone I work with, a, a coworker I work very closely with, who sent me a photo, and I believe this was like two weeks ago, and the drifts outside of his house were like as tall as the garage. They were like stacked and he had he had, had to shovel all that out and he sent me a photo of it. How much snow have you been battling up there recently? It's it's not it's not been that much, but it's more that it doesn't go away. So every time it snows again, it adds. And then the plows come and it's on the end of your driveway. And by the time you shovel out, you add on to the drifts again. So I, I can totally see where that's coming from. Yeah, we've been, we've gotten killed this winter for sure. <laughs> so uh, something people, you know, things that about you uh, that I know that maybe those who are uh, getting to, uh, to watch us for the first time uh, together may not know because we don't get to play Toronto all the time, but you came on the Aftershock last year. Um, but uh, you are on, in part of American Soccer Analysis, but you are a college soccer coach in the Great White North and in the Toronto area. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about the coaching that you do up there. Yeah, so I, I uh, have been coaching in the university game for, this is my sixth year coming up, fifth year coming up. Um, I coach at the University of Toronto, which is one of the biggest schools up here. Um, we are a pretty strong program, kind of one of the top 10 in the country every year. For the American listeners, I would say comparatively, we would be like 50 to 60th ranked in NCAA, something like that. Um, but the level is getting better and better every year. You're seeing players go pro every year. So it's it's really on the up and up. Yeah. And you also host now on the American Soccer Analysis podcast, two things that I think are are worth noting. First, uh, I haven't gotten to listen to it myself, but I've heard really, really good things. You just did an NWSL season preview. For, so here in the Bay Area, NWSL is going to be coming to the Bay here very soon. And so for people who want to get uh, familiar with the league, familiar with some of the teams, maybe some of the, the top players, you did an NWSL preview with a couple, couple of hosts. You want to tell us a bit about the show? Yeah, so we've been... For those of you who are, are in the ASA space and seeing what's going on, we've been putting out our, our season previews this week for the season opener starting Saturday. Uh, so if you can get a chance to catch those games, absolutely do. The level is going to be crazy this year. Uh, and we decided <clears throat> we've never really done a women's soccer podcast before at ASA, and we decided we'll try it out see what the response is. If people love it, we'll do it again. And the response has been pretty good, so I would definitely recommend checking it out. It'll be on your ASA podcast feed. It's, it's a really exciting time for women's soccer in the club side where it's always been fun internationally, but the club game is really, really growing. Yeah, so check out the American Soccer Analysis podcast and uh, at Analysis Evolved on Twitter if you want to follow all things going on there. And also sometimes you get a chance to uh, jump on with, uh, with uh, Ian Lamberson and uh, my good buddy Harrison Crow and host uh, a men's version, the, uh, the MLS side, in which... You have been asking them questions as like a game show host. How did this come about? You're 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 new to the show as of about halfway through last year, uh, and and I, that was something that just kind of came out of left field for me in the first episode. Like all of a sudden, it's game show Kieran, and I hadn't experienced <laughs> this version of Kieran before. Give us a little bit of the background. How did uh, how did that come about? Yeah, I like I've always been a big trivia guy. I played like quiz bowl in high school. Um, and there's an NBA podcast on the athletic feed that they play. It's called like one of the hosts name versus the beat. And they talk about different teams each week and they do trivia where the main guy goes against these writers. And I was like, oh, there's like a lot of really weird MLS things. Like, let's see if Harrison and Ian would be into this. <laughs> and the first episode was really funny. And like, we have a, a Patreon discord for ASA and we put the questions in there as a Google form. And like the second the form hits the chat, people are like, I got six, I got six out of six this week. I got four out of six. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty great. It's a lot of fun. It does seem like a lot of fun. And uh, it seems like that last question, there's always enough points for whomever has been bombing the entire time to maybe catch back up. So there's been some really great comebacks 
so far. So if you haven't gotten to catch that, uh, check it out. I think you guys have done at least one this season, maybe two. Yeah, uh, we've got one one MLS episode out, another one that should be out tomorrow morning, fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled. And for those of you who uh, are not a believer in Austin FC, the thing you need to know about <laughs> Kieran is neither is he. He is predicting no. a massive fall from grace back to earth. And I think you were vindicated some last season because while they started off the season hot, second half of the season, they actually played exactly to their, their expected goals. And starting off this season, a really bad fall out of CONCACAF Champions League. So you must feel a bit of vindication, uh, uh, don't you? Yeah, I will, I will say the number of angry mentions I get decreases every week as they tumble down the standings. <laughs> I actually I actually ended up in Austin for San Jose Austin last year. Oh, yeah. Um, that crazy 3-3 game. So yeah. that was a lot of fun. Great. Uh, okay, well, let's talk a little bit more earthquakes, but this time with uh, something you're an expert about, Toronto FC. Um, wow, both teams. I like to say this is uh, Quakes 1.5 versus Toronto 1.5. Not quite, you know, uh, Quakes 2 versus TFC 2, but uh, just maybe a level above. A lot of guys out for injuries and international call-ins. Like, uh, talk to me about the international call-ins. Who is not available uh, for Toronto FC for uh, tomorrow's game due to international call-ins? Yeah, so TFC are in a really tough spot because... Uh, Bill Manning's kind of said publicly, like this year is get the first group together, see where they're at. And then just by the way, the MLS salary cap works, like let's start adding depth in the summer and next year. So that depth really isn't there yet. So when you're looking for, for Saturday's game, Insigne is out due to injury. Then you have Richie Larea is out due to call up. There's a starting fullback gone. Mark Anthony K is gone. Jonathan Osorio is gone. Io Akinola hasn't been starting and has been kind of an injury doubt, but he's gone. Um, and then Thomas Romero, the backup goalkeeper, is with El Salvador as well. So it's kind of four key, key, key starters, and two of them being midfielders when TFC are only really carrying four midfielders. They've got um, two academy players that are going to be in the squad tomorrow who signed their first TFC two deals today. So wow. very, very thin. Very thin roster. So, you know, it's uh, it's an opportunity, obviously, for the Quakes with the home cooking to get some points, but they're faced – facing their own injury situation. Carlos Guerrezo is a huge question mark. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, uh, at least Judson has been upgraded now to questionable. There's a chance that he could play uh, as a substitute tomorrow. So maybe some good news for Quakes fans there. But also uh, Jamiro Montero also with a, with a call-in uh, and uh, left back uh, Miguel Trout goes out. So both teams, you know, feeling the effects. Uh, the Quakes haven't had Judson. Haven't had Nico Shakiris, you know, since the start of the season. Uh, Daniel, who was the goalkeeper to start the season, also out. So both teams, you know, a bit banged up, you know, international call-ins. Uh, but as they say, this is now an opportunity for other players to step up and, and show what they can do. If uh, if you if uh, you you think there's someone who hasn't been able to step up so far, or hasn't had the opportunity to step up so far, but you're interested to see what they do tomorrow. Who should fans keep an eye on? Probably the most exciting one is Jaquil Marshall Ruddy. Um, he's kind of an, a really exciting young. Traditionally, he's been a winger. Mm -hmm. um, he went on trial with Liverpool and Arsenal this summer. He's actually in the background of the Arsenal All or Nothing. He's in like two scenes because okay. um, he was on trial during the show. It's quite funny. He's, he's famous. Yeah, but he he's kind of an exciting one that people have been pegging like, oh, he's going to be the next one to go to Europe. Mm. Uh, he's been converted to a fullback under Bob Bradley. And he just hasn't played at all this year. Um, and I think with Richie Larray out, he's kind of the natural person who's going to get that go on the right-hand side. Very, very attacking player. Great dribbler. Has very good service in the final third. He's the one kind of overlapping Bernadeschi that I think is, is probably the one to keep an eye on. Talk about Bernadeschi a bit because, you know, he's not going to have the weapons around him that he, he usually has. But uh, I believe an assist last week off of a set piece you know, how is uh, his form looking, you know, right now? Uh, and, uh, you know, is he the focal point, you know, of this attack right now? Or, you know, how much do players like uh, Michael Bradley still potentially factor into the way that uh, TFC is going to play tomorrow? Yeah, I think in the attacking third, it's all Berna all the time, especially while Insigne has been out. It's very, can we find him dribbling inside to create an attack? Um 
and he's been okay this year. Like his his underlying metrics have never been super strong in MLS, but the actual goals and assist numbers have been very strong. So we'll see if those come back down to earth, which they probably will. But um, there's been a little bit of tension between him and the rest of the team where he kind of made some comments about we need to play more and maybe Matt Hedges and Sean Johnson are not the most suited to playing all the time. But in their half, everything runs through Michael Bradley. He is still the focal point who gets on the ball in every possession. He is building kind of everything good that happens for TFC starts with him in the build. So from a Quake's point of view, if their press is going to look good and is going to cut off Michael Bradley, TFC are going to really struggle. So talk to me a bit about the uh, kind of the remade defense, because last year that defense, you know, was one of the worst, if not, you know, probably the second worst in the league compared to the Quakes, honestly. Um, I can't remember the number of goals given up, but it was a lot. Um, and But there have been some changes. You, you mentioned Matt Hedges. You also uh, mentioned Sean Johnson. Talk to us a little bit about uh, kind of the, the new look defense, even if it's not at 100% with, with the Collins. Yeah, so last year was uh, a disaster is maybe the nicest way to put it, which says a lot. Uh, I think TFC conceded something like 50 goals in, in 30 games. So I don't think it was quite the worst. I think there were a few teams that were for, worse off, but... DC United, uh, the Quakes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, course. yeah. So so kind of overhauling that was a huge, a huge goal for this year. So bringing Matt Hedges as a free agent, they signed Sigurd Rosted from Scandinavia, who's been definitely better than I was expecting. They signed uh, an Italian youth international who was playing in Turkey and Raul Petretta at left back, who has kind of been up and down. And then Richie Larea is still on loan until June, and then we'll see where that goes from there. So it, it, just comparing player for player, it's night and day compared to last year. Uh, and so far, as much as the results have not been amazing, like TFC have been okay defensively uh, in terms of their actually conceded is not is much lower than last year. A lot of that is because they've had more of the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, but Sean Johnson has been a little bit more consistent. He had a bit of a stinker in the first game, but he's been a, stole points against Atlanta. The center back combo is getting better every game. Um, the level defensively has been much, much higher. At the same time, the midfield defending in front of them is very, very slow. And sometimes it, it feels we'll win the ball on our 18 and we'll build, 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 and then we'll see where it goes. So there's not not a lot of high turnovers happening from this, this TFZ team. Yeah, they don't uh, – I think contrary to what the Quakes faced last week when they played St. Louis City, they faced you know that kind of like intense Red Bull-style type, type press – uh, TFC is on the opposite side of the PPDA spectrum. The passes per defensive action, second lowest in the league. Uh, not really, I'm, I'm going to guess, probably a pressing team, particularly on the road. Uh, how do you expect them to line up defensively? Yeah, so generally the shape is a 4 4 2 in a mid block. Um, sometimes it's one of the wingers staying high. Uh, so the first two games of the season, it was Bernardeschi high. And since then, it's been uh, oh so high. And so they've kind of pivoted that way, and they have the wingers screen wide passes, and they try and as soon as you play passes between the lines, they close and they try and jump things. Uh, Yeah, definitely not super aggressive from pressing situations, but very much like once you hit our line of engagement, we are going to defend fairly aggressively. So give us uh, any any other further thoughts uh, about tomorrow. Uh, You mentioned... You know, Sean Johnson had the stinker in the first game. That was a game that uh, they where they, they were at DC United and ended up, yeah. uh, you know, kind of pulling a <laughs> pulling a Quakes a reverse a reverse Goonies like the Quakes did in, in game game one too. But things you mentioned had settled down since then. You know, what else uh, might uh, Quakes fans want to keep an eye on tomorrow? Yeah, I I think an, an interesting one is to see how aggressive Toronto are with a super rotated team mm. because on one hand, yeah, the, the general style with all the starters is slow. Let's possess. We'll defend kind of, we won't press a ton, but a lot of the replacements that are coming in are going to be very, very young. Uh, Deandre Kerr has been starting up front the last two games who had a, an interesting first season in MLS last year, but is just really good runner in behind. Very, very active for collecting second balls, things like that. Um, and then you have kind of a lot more energy coming in compared to Mark Anthony K and Osorio, who are much more composed players. Um, but I expect we might see 
Um, maybe a Kelsey Thompson comes in. We might see uh, the other option we might see is they go older and they bring Victor Vasquez in, um, who is not the runner, but is probably the best passer TFC have in the team. So it'll be interesting to see which way Bob Bradley goes. Well, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, I think, an interesting matchup for both teams. They're, they both feel like, you know, they, they could use three points uh, tomorrow in a, in a pretty strong way. And, uh, you know, it's it seems like an important game now for both teams to try to find a way with uh, with a bit of, uh, you know, less than ideal starting lineup probably to uh, to be able to get those points. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Kieran, and I really appreciate uh, you joining me here today. Uh, you know, best of luck in everything from a college soccer side, of course, this season. Uh, and, and as a former goalkeeper, I do want to get your opinion on, on something before we, we hang up here. Because one of the things that we've seen now is just these absolute bangers from Tiago Almada. And... Everyone has these kind of different opinions as, you know, is it more Almada or was it poor goalkeeping different situations? We've also seen now, uh, you know, some of the, um, uh, let's say Nick Romando uh, came out last week and said, you know, if you put five in the wall from that distance, you've already made a mistake and, uh, you know, gotten yourself beat from there because you're not going to be able to see the ball and be able to react to it. As a former goalkeeper, uh, is this more like, you know, really good from the goalkeeper should be doing something a bit different here? Yeah, I, I think you kind of have to judge on a case-by-case -case basis. The free kick last week, when I saw it live, I was like, oh, this is a horrible goalkeeping. Like, this is a real blunder. And then you see the back angle and you see how much up and down there is and how much right to left there is. And it's pretty hard to be critical. I definitely agree with Nick Romando, though, that um, this is a thing I've, I've actually looked at a little bit analytically is how many players you should be putting in your wall. Mm -hmm. And um, from distance, it's very unlikely you're going to block the free kick anyways. So going three, four, five isn't really worth it. You're just taking players out from marking or from collecting second balls. Um, so especially when you're talking about kind of the wall is outside of the 18 yard box, you really have to think about how worth it is to put five players in. I think in general, Almada is a very, very good striker of the ball. And, and when we talk kind of about players gaming their XG, like as an elite, elite ball striker, he, maybe he is one of those players who does that we obviously need more sample, but um I think there can be a tendency in MLS sometimes when we see people score bangers that is like, ah, I don't know. He might've done better on that one. <laughs> well, I appreciate the insight as always, Kieran. And, uh, you know, we'll be talking more to you uh, a little bit, probably later in the season fans, be sure to check out the American soccer analysis podcast. Kieran is a host for now both the men's and the women's uh, podcast on that feed. So uh, be sure to, to check that out. And also, uh, you probably wrote, what, half, I think, of the uh, previews for both NWSL and, and MLS. Uh, what uh, previews do you have out there for NWSL for fans to go read? Uh, NWSL, I've got Casey Current, who are my pick to win the league this year, which I'm very wow. excited okay. about. Uh, Angel City and I can't remember. San Diego Wave. San Diego which, Wave. Uh, San Diego Wave, who are super, super fun. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be a very fun end of USL season. Two California teams in there. Well, Karen, we appreciate all the hard work on that, and uh, we'll be catching up to you soon. And uh, I can't wait to uh, get in the chats and be able to, to chat about uh, how the game goes on Saturday. We'll talk to you soon. Good, good luck, not too much luck. <laughs> all right, take care.